Muy buenos días, muy buenas tardes, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to this session, which is titled Immigrant Communities and Trauma, Addressing the Disproportionate Challenges Latino Families Face. It is my pleasure to serve as the moderator today. My name is Cindy Benavides, and I serve as a CEO of LULAC. Um, and before we kick it off, a huge shout out to Hispanic Federation, to HF, for day three of just wonderful back-to-back -back discussions and panels and really talking about the issue of education at different levels and how it's impacting our families, our children, educators, and the entire ecosystem. I am delighted. I am over the moon to be sharing this space with wonderful leaders, Latinas, who are leading across this country on issues of education, immigration, and so many other intersections. And so we're going to jump right in. And, you know, before I get started, just a huge shout out to Diana Cruz for all the work that she's been doing behind the scenes and making sure that we were ready to go to address, you know, this specific issue that is so important to all of us. So I'm going to ask Greisa, Natalia, Ileana, and Nancy to please want to introduce yourselves and also share where you are based and why this work inspires you. So why don't we start with you, Natalia, then Ileana, Grecia, and we'll, we'll end it with Nancy. Hi, thank you so much to Hispanic Fed and also Echo, thank you to Diana. I uh, really appreciate all your work. Um, and so I am Natalia Alejandra Varela. I'm an associate counsel with Latino Justice Pearl Duff. Um, and I am part Salvadorian, part Colombian. And I have, um, you know, why does this work mean a lot? to me. Um, you know, I think it's just at the core of everything and who I am, my lived experiences and um, definitely part of my shared experiences um, and how I communicate. And um, I just think that all of the work that um, I get involved with is so personal um, and I love doing it and I love working within the Latinx community and um, hopefully empowering uh, people. So that's really a big portion of it. And I will Pass on. Ileana? Great. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, today with all these amazing women. Um, my name is Ileana Perez, and I serve as a director of research and entrepreneurship with Immigrants Rising. I'm based out of the California Bay Area. Um, I am a foreign DACA recipient. I've been undocumented in this country for the past 25 years. So my work is also very personal. It's personal to me, to my younger brother, to my family, and to um, so many other undocumented immigrants in this country who um, are really looking to uh, not just survive, but thrive in this country. Um, so um, I'll get an opportunity to share a little bit about um, our work. Um, and I specifically work around um, the development of our entrepreneurship programming. Great. Kaysa? Gracias, Cindy. Hola a todos y a todas. Um, oh, I see Laura, my friend on the chat. So good to see so many great people. Um, my name is Grecia Martinez Rosas. I am the daughter of Luis and Elia Martinez. I am undocumented, unafraid, queer, and unashamed. And I have the honor to serve as United We Dream and United We Dream Actions Executive Director. Um, I am really, we are the nation's largest immigrant youth-led network in the country with more than 800,000 young people that serve at the intersection of gender, race, class, and immigration status. And I am beyond the moon excited as we go into the last two weeks um, into this election to be grounded in the power of pe women of color, of Latinas in this space, and of all of you that are joining us and really grateful, Cindy, um, and all of, the, all of the team from the Hispanic Federation for your invitation to join you today. Great. Nancy? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nancy Mesa. I'm the National Organizing Director with Raices, um, based in Texas. Um, yeah, and let's see for me. Um, yeah, I'm originally from Mexico, Jalisco, sunny Jaliscienses. What up? Um, yeah, so um, similar to Ileana, right, and Grecia, um, um, I'm directly impacted by the current injustices in, our, in, in this world, right? And uh, what really inspires me to do this work is 
um, kind of seen the power that we've already built, right? Um, a lot of us came into the, this movement as immigrant youth organizers, right? As student organizers, and we're crazy enough to still be here. <laughs> um, so that gives me a lot of hope, right? That there's a lot of folks um, that are still in the movement and we're co continuously working to, to make sure that, that we're building um, thriving vibrant, vibrant movements to build power. So that gets me really excited. Gracias, Nancy, for that. And I will tell you that as a Honduran American, I was brought to this country at the age of one. And so I, I share in that immigrant journey. And I also just wanted to give a huge shout out to my NHLA, NHLA hermana, um, who is doing amazing work at HF, Laura Esquivel, um, who I know all of you know, and, and just always luchando, always pushing forward. So with that, why don't we dive in? We know that you know, so many of our immigrant communities, our families, our students are being impacted. Not only were they impacted as we saw this administration come in, but we now on top have COVID-19, which is disproportionately impacting the Latino community. So why don't we kick it off with you, Grisa, to talk about how United We Dream has been working in this space with our dreamers, with our DACA recipients, and addressing the challenges we're facing. Then we will go uh, to Natalia, next to Nancy, and last, Ileana. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, United We Dream is a space where immigrant young people, where young people of color can come together to feel empowered to share our stories. And we know that part of United We Dream, some of us are DACA recipients like myself. Um, some of us are folks that have the courage to come to this country by ourselves. Um, some people may call us uh, uh, young people, like unaccompanied minors, <laughs> you know? Uh, but we had the courage to be able to come to the US by ourselves. Some of us love undocumented people and are, are children of undocumented folks. And so the, the breadth of the United We Dream membership experience is broad and wide. Um, I'll say that, that part of the moment that we are in is being able to, as, as Nancy was saying, being able to be really grounded, that we have everything um, inside of ourselves to be able to face this moment. We have crossed rivers, we have crossed deserts, and we have been able in our lineage and in our blood to be able to respond to that. And so, you know, I feel I feel really clearly that in the moment that we're in, when we're at the intersection of a national pandemic, a exposure of how the economic and healthcare systems have failed systematically to black and brown people in particular and indigenous folks. And when we're also seeing the rise of white supremacy embodied by uh, Donald Trump and his supporters and anyone that does not like stand up to him, that this moment is also a confirmation that we are like truly in the right place and in the right moment that immigrants will be the ones that will take us out of this um, awful moment and that uh, both through our labor, through our vision, through our dreams, through our work, uh, but also because we are firmly committed to the idea or the discipline of hope. Um, and it's this hope that is able to allow us that when the DACA decision came out um, and, you know, we like Donald Trump, that was his day one, like promise to his base that he was going to get rid of the DACA program. Here we are two weeks into the election and I can go back into my house right now and reach out and grab my DACA. And that is not uh, by accident. And it's not because um, someone felt good in the inside of their heart. It is because of grassroots organizing, political organizing, because of the power of our people. And DACA is one example of what immigrant people are able to imagine, make sure that we fight for and bring into reality. And so, and this moment where this country is having a racial justice conversation, when we are together saying that Black Lives Matters, on the steps of the Supreme Court on decision day, it was a moment where we were in the middle of these uprisings and people would have totally understood if we would have just been like, oh yay, DACA, no more. Like we won, we beat Donald Trump. Like. People would have understood that, but that's not the moment that we're in right now. And what happened on that day is that people all across the country said without any hesitation, yes, we won. Uh, immigrant young people led the strategy to be able to do that. Um, 
our home is here. We're here to stay. We're queer and unashamed and Black Lives Matter and we must defund the police and we must abolish ICE and CBP. And so that is the beauty of the moment that we are in and the passion and all of it for me is grounded in nuestra cultura, in the people that have uh, fed into us. And that is what we are seeing the reflection of today. So I'm um, excited to be able to dig into more. Thank you so much for that, Teresa. And, and, you know, being on the older side of millennials, I remember before being in this role that our dreamers were knocking on so many doors and being turned away. And yet you persisted, yet you kept going, yet you kept organizing. And so this speaks to the diversity, through the strength, to the perseverance, to the roots of our community. And I just thank you, Grace, for your leadership and all that you're doing and continue to do. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Natalia. And Natalia, we want to hear about what Latino Justice is doing. What is your role? How have you been working to keep the fight going, to protect, to defend our comunidad? Wow, thank you for repeating the question. I got so lost in Grisa that I was like, oh no, I hope they don't expect that I remember the question. <laughs> Um, so, you know, Latino justice, I think um, we come from a different perspective where a lot of times we're taking we're taking our steps um, because of the work of other of all the panelists on this call. Um, and so we are, you know, specifically, I'm an attorney, I'm an attorney at Latino justice. And so we are trying to we're always trying to listen more so from the community versus them taking any steps on our own. Um, and so I think the truth is, is that um, and during this time, I guess what we're doing, I think what we're doing is we're really taking time to, um, to, to be positive and to rise from what's happening, to rise with, from what's happening. Because even though it is a very difficult time, it is also a time for rebirth, that means, and re, and rebuilding and thinking in a new way. And I think part of what we're doing in that, in that moment is looking internally right now, um, looking internally in ourselves, within our families, specifically when we think about um, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, having very real conversations about um, our roles as, Lat as Latinos in the Black Lives Matter movement and our roles in oppression. And so I think that's a really big portion of what's going on for us right now, but then simultaneously thinking about empowerment and what that looks like. And we are, and that's and that's a big challenge for a legal organization like ours right now, when we see the courts um, being vitiated of their powers and then also um, the courts being packed in different in different ways with judges that um, are questionable. Also the passing of, our, of RBG has been uh, extremely taxing uh, to think about. And, to, and so I think right now it's about um, how do how do we keep moving on? How, what are what are the different strategies that we can use legally, but also thinking more um, about policy? And oh, and you know the the truth is is that uh, what keeps I think what keeps a, a, a light with us is just looking at the community, looking at people like Grisa, looking at these panelists, everyone coming forward, and just the power behind the people, and how do we support that, and make sure that we're supporting that and 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 pushing at the same time. Um, and so I think those are it. And I think the other thing is kind of doing a new analysis um, because of the fact that we know, you know, we've always known the law has tons of limitations. You know what I mean? You can you can only do so much with the law. And so um, I think the truth is, is kind of looking at um, an analysis of public health and looking at this as an opportunity to look at all of our work through public health. Frequently, I think that we will sometimes get siloed into looking maybe at uh, criminal, uh, like the criminal justice system or car carceral systems and thinking about public health and how do we move forward. But I think that this is a very good time for us to talk about what is healthy for our communities. And, you know, and that doesn't mean access only to health care. I mean, how are people feeling safe and protected within their community? And how can we look to one another to provide that versus um, relying on systems that are intentionally or were and are intentionally built on premises of, of white supremacy uh, and thinking about what it, what is it, what it looks like for us, for everyone to feel safe. So, um, yeah. 
Well, gracias for that, Natalia, and thank you as always for fighting on, on the legal front and, you know, really bringing to light the fact that so many of these systems, including our education system, you know, was not built with our communities in mind. And it's the fact that we have to rethink and reshape and maybe even construct a new systems that keep our communities at the center is so important. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Nancy with Raices Texas to tell us a little bit about the work uh, that she is doing through Raices. Awesome, and I'm so glad to be going after Natalia because I, I think, right, every, every legal service provider has that tension, right? Where like, we know the courts in the system aren't set up for us, but we still know we have to like, track them right and figure out how to navigate them or find loopholes as well um yeah but so for if, so as i mentioned i'm the national organizer organizing director with raices and for folks who aren't familiar um we're a nonprofit organization that promotes justice by providing free and low-cost legal services um to immigrant children families refugees um so we have both a legal services department social programs um, bond assistant and an advocacy team. So I'm part of the advocacy team. And uh, we really focus on changing the narrative and organizing around migrant justice. And overall our view, right, um, our, our vision for society is that we envision a society where all people have the right to migrate and where human rights are guaranteed. Um, so I feel like, you know, um, the work that I do at ISIS is really focused on kind of like that human rights lens um, because we're just seeing atrocities, right? And I know folks here in this call know, right, or might be aware, just it, when you work in immigrant rights, especially in detention work, when, when you're a service, when you, you know, when you're um, a service provider to detention centers, we really have, um, it's right, both, a, both like a, it's a double-edged sword, right? We kind of have really direct connections to what's happening within the detention centers in Texas. That also means that we, you know, it's, it's, it's heavy. Um, so I would say, you know, um, uh, within COVID, one of the first things we started seeing, um, right, as I said, I said, we do have the, the opportunity to offer and kind of be like the, the legal service provider to, to current detention center, right, and family detention centers in Texas. A lot of our work, um, on the detention side is really focusing around um, family detention, right? Um, we know that in 2018, that was a huge national outcry, but family detention is still, still exists, right? Um, and in Texas, we have uh, two of the three family detentions that exist in the United States, right? Which are Carnes and Dilly. Um, so kind of some of, the, some of the things that we saw right away um, is how this administration, right? Um, and the Dep Department of Homeland Security continue to be one of the main spreaders of the virus, right? Um, well, you know, I think when, when COVID hit, um, the immigrant rights community, criminal justice community, right? Everyone came together really to plea and make the demand for folks to, to put who are currently detained to be freed, right? Because there is no way that anyone can socially distance with the detention centers, right? There is no way that folks can socially distance and take the precautions they need inside prisons and jails, right? So. Um, what, we, what we're seeing is, you know, um, specifically in Texas, is a complete disregard for human life, um, even in the midst of a global pandemic, right? Um, detention centers still continue to be filled, folks are being transferred, folks continue to be deported, right? And kind of like rapid turned around um, deportation. So we really see, are seeing how ICE is, is one of the biggest spreaders of the virus, right? Um, folks are detained there's no way they could spread that virus but they're being moved around and, and precautions aren't, aren't being are just yeah like there is no regard for human life um but specifically um for Carnes um family detention center um we have seen a different trend right so currently um uh, within Carnes, most of the families that they're right and when we talk about families we're talking about families right so as Ray says we represent um entire families right so it's children who are six months old to like, and their parents. So we have toddlers that are currently still in these family detention centers. Um, and the majority of them are Haitian. Um, so they are black immigrants, right? So I think that is one of the notions that we've had to uplift, right? As Raiz says, is that um, immigration, right? Isn't just only a Latino issue. Um, and that immigration is also a, um, a Black Lives Matter issue, right? That they are not mutually exclusive. Um, but that is kind of like the biggest trend that we've seen around COVID. Also with Prairie Land Detention Center, right now what we're seeing is that there is a mass amount of Cameroonians, right? Who are who have been fighting, um, who have been organizing inside detention centers for the last two years, um, who are, you know, fleeing a civil war, seeking asylum, um, 
yeah, and, 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 you know, just last week, our organizers were on the ground at the airport trying to stop buses, right? Um, and unfortunately, some folks were, um, were deported, and today there's another mass action. So kind of what we've seen um, in terms of COVID and the work that we're doing around migrant justice is that, um, right, on the outside, I think it really has pushed a lot of us to really become more abolitionists, right, to really push for folks um, not just to be giving lower sentences, but to just to be released, right? To kind of look at the conditions um, inside detention centers and inside prisons and call them inhumane and act on that. Um, but on the flip side, what we've seen is like a total disregard um, from the administration and and the Department of Homeland Security, basically for human life, you know? Um, I know it's super downer, um, <laughs> so I apologize for that, but it really, it, it is kind of, it, it's, it's the reality that we're facing right now. Um, so in terms of the organizing, right, I think um, it has really pushed us, uh, folks on the outside to to be more grounded and to, and to be more responsive in terms of answering the calls to action from detainees who are organizing themselves inside, right? So um, really the, the flip, right, is like detainees are organizing inside, they're, they're launching hunger strikes, right? They're launching campaigns um, and they're organized and they really need us um, who are on the outside um, to really step up and support them. Thank you, Nancy, so much. And thank you for all that you're doing and really organizing at the national level um, with Raices. Ileana, why don't you talk a little bit about immigrants rising and the work that you're doing and maybe, you know, one or two priorities that you've really been focused on in the last few months? Definitely. Thank you so much. Um, so for those of you not familiar with Immigrants Rising, we are a nonprofit organization based out of the Bay Area. But um, initially, the organization actually started to increase access to higher education for undocumented students through fundraising for scholarships. Uh, but that was 15 years ago. Um, and over time, the organization has really um, worked directly with undocumented people. We are um, the leaders of the organization um, and really identifying all the different elements that go into ensuring that undocumented students can actually um, pursue higher education and succeed. Um, so over the years, we've been able to incorporate legal services, mental health, um, fellowships, um, scholarships, and uh, my program specifically focuses on ensuring that the undocumented community um, learns about income generation options through entrepreneurship. Um, and so one of the things that is, um, well, a few of the things that we have focused on um, specifically as a result of COVID, uh, we know that there's been a huge economic financial burden um, for undocumented families. Um, and this really is something that we have learned over the years that when an undocumented student enrolls in college, they really bring in their entire family. This is a family effort. Um, most of the time, undocumented students have um, historically, historically have had to work while pursuing Doing higher education. So specifically during this time when oftentimes the parents, other family members lose their job, this becomes a huge burden for an undocumented student to be able to um, continue with their education. Um, so that's definitely one area that we, we have tried to work with. Um, we have a, um, a program called our Catalyst Fund, where we work closely with 32 um, California colleges and universities, primarily community colleges. And we work directly with administrators with staff, with faculty to implement institutional practices that can really support undocumented students. So right now in the midst of COVID and um, specifically undocumented families getting excluded from federal aid, um, from having unemployment benefits, it's really been up to a lot of the colleges and universities to step in and identify ways to be able to um, provide that financial support that can really help not just the student, but the families themselves. So that's been a huge area that we have worked on um, to try to um, work at the institutional level and also to try to figure out ways to change, um, to identify state support and of course identify the possibility of expanding um, financial um, support specifically um, uh, for families affected by COVID. Um, in addition to that, um, through my work with entrepreneurship, um, it's really been um, important for the the undocumented community to figure out ways to pivot. Um, and again, this goes for individuals themselves looking for ways to be able to generate income based on their own skills, abilities, and so also for the family members, family members who are entrepreneurs, who do have businesses, who um, have been doing entrepreneurial activities that may have had to be shut down as a result of the pandemic. Um, we've been identifying ways for individuals to learn about different ways to either shift to online environments um, or to 
to learn a little bit more about um, sort of the, 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 w the new way of doing things in the middle of a pandemic. So um, that's definitely where my program is really focused around ensuring that individuals um, are aware that there are additional ways for individuals to be able to generate income. And so um, in addition to that, um, really, we are fully aware of the need for mental health services. We know that this has been an issue forever <laughs> for many of us who have been affected by this for so many years. Um, and so mental health is um, definitely a key area that we have expanded um, over the last few months. Um, e immediately at the onset of the of the pandemic, we started hosting weekly wellness gatherings led by our mental health advocates, uh, where it's a safe space and opportunity for people to come together um, and be able to just talk about all the different challenges that so many people are affected by. Uh, we were also able to launch our mental health connector um, uh, specific to the state of California where we connect undocumented individuals to mental health providers. Um, and so um, those kind of opportunities are definitely something that uh, would be exciting to see develop across other states um, so that you know we start to think about all the different support systems that can be available um, for the undocumented community. Thank you for that, Ileana. And, you know, like I would just go ahead and jump right in, Ileana, and also ask you, you know, and, and I think you touched upon so many different issues. And, you know, so many of us, I think before, felt like we were drinking out of fire hoses, and now it feels like we're trying to drink an ocean. And, you know, seeing that compounded trauma occurring in our families. And I'm wondering, Ileana, in the work that you're doing, what needs are more difficult to meet for students and families right now? I know you mentioned mental health, obviously like the financial insecurity and food insecurity, but what other issues are you seeing that are, are difficult? Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest issues that we have seen is one, access to technology. So I think before we were all sort of thinking that we all had a computer or a tablet when that has not been the case for many low income and documented communities to have access to the right technology. And of course, the second biggest barrier is access to reliable Wi-Fi. I mean, with this entire shift to a virtual learning community, um, it really does depend um, on having that reliable Wi-Fi, which oftentimes is not available um, in certain geographic areas. Oftentimes it's too expensive when people are trying to figure out um, how to meet other financial um, needs. So definitely those two areas just create a huge burden when it becomes impossible for students to be able to join their online classes. It becomes impossible for um, their parents to be able to um, identify services, programming. Um, I feel that the, like the fact that also a lot of um, services and programming is no longer available in person, how do people find those organizations, those connections uh, virtually um, becomes extremely complicated. So I definitely feel that, you know, while many of us do have the privilege of having the technology, the internet, it is not something that is available um, to the wider community. And that in itself brings so many other issues. Gracias, Ileana. And as we shift to Grace, uh, you know, also to point out that one in three Latinos do not have access to technology and broadband. One in three. And that just tells you of not only the digital divide, but the digital abyss that we're experiencing as a community. Grace, in, in the work that you do, how is the conversation during this pandemic for DACA and non-DACA immigrants different than from, you know, pre-COVID, right? And, and I can't even believe that we're talking in pre and hopefully at one point post-COVID, but how it, how how is this time during this pandemic different for our DACA and non-DACA immigrants? And also, you know, for those advocates that are out there, you know, what legislation should they be keeping an eye on to be able to contact their members of Congress or be ready to go come in the new, you know, new potentially new administration? That's a great question, Cindy, thank you. So, you know, this year we've seen immigrants, black and brown communities, we've been the ones hit hardest um, by COVID-19. And this is a direct result by what I talked about earlier, which is like pre-existing health inequalities for our communities uh, who oftentimes have no health care. Um, and also it is because of deliberate political decisions that have been prioritized the needs of corporations and the 1% instead of the people um, that are, are serving and ensuring that this country was able to move forward in this last now almost 10 months of a, of a mass pandemic. 
I think that um, all through all of this moment, we've, we've seen um, how um, undocumented folks have were forced to be able to go to work at the polleras in the middle of this of this pandemic, um, not knowing what the effect of of COVID nineteen will be. We saw the photos of farm workers in California being able to continue to do the work, not only in the midst of a pandemic, but also when wildfires were like burning around them. Um, and I think that the thing that is unique about this moment is not that like undocumented people have been, have not only that we've been like uh, pushed out of any uh, legislation, both and let's not let's not talk about the last 25 years, but even in this last year when it came to COVID relief, undocumented people, it wasn't an oversight. It wasn't like, oh, it just slipped someone's mind or no one thought to write it down. It was a deliberate attack against undocumented people where even those that are U.S. citizens that lived in a home with undocumented folks were not able to benefit from some of the benefits of the limited benefits that this country and this government gave to people in the U.S. So, you know, I want to be clear about I am now in my two months, my first two months as the executive director of UWD. Uh, it's been a hell of a ride. Um, and I want to be clear about the commitment that I've made to our movement. And the commitment um, that I'm asking from, from each of you all is to ensure that it's going to take all of us to ensure that we're fighting for racial justice and our collective liberation. That we know that we are, that once, if anyone is not free until everyone is free, no one of us are free. To be honest with you, we are done with the comp bad compromises that seek to trade our dreams for growth in guns and surveillance of deportation agents. We are done with the bills that exclude immigrants and working class people who have always been essential to this country. We are done with policies that help some of us while hurting others. And the forces of white supremacy will do whatever it takes to win. So we need to keep advancing forward together with a refusal a refusal to go back to politics that would seek to divide us. And unfortunately, the reality is that regardless of the outcome of the election, the conditions for undocumented people will continue to be dire. Our people right now are facing evictions in the face of mass deportations in our homes. Just last week, we saw that there were raids in California. Just last month, we saw that Donald Trump had recruited ICE and CBP agents to go after not only undocumented people, but U.S. citizens in places like Portland and Chicago. So it is not... Um, it, it will continue. To, it will be a turn of events if, if we have a different outcome in the election, but it will not end the pain immediately. And it's true that the Trump administration has been devastating for immigrants. We've seen it for, firsthand from enacting the Muslim ban to going after DACA protections of immigrant young people to attacking TPS and DED. Uh, the situation in Puerto Rico and the way that he dealt with that, you know, I could go on and on, but you all know this. And while, yes, the Trump administration has definitely ramped up the attacks on immigrants, they are working within a system of immigration and enforcement that has built by Republicans and Democrats for decades. And this is ripe for corruption and cruelty, which is why, you know, at United We Dream, people have called us radical for calling for the abolishment of ICE and for dreaming of a world without deportations. But did we let that stop us? No. People called us radical when we went after President Obama, demanding that we had protections from deportations that are now called DACA and that protect me. Did we let people saying that that was impossible stop us? No. And that is the history of Latinos, that is the history of Hispanics, that is the history of our people in this country. We found our way and we won programs like DACA. And so in this moment, when we are facing COVID together, you know, I we I know that the community and undocumented people appreciate kind words and commitments from everyone that has joined in calling for families to, to stay together, for kids to be let out of cages. And what I invite all of you is to support the leadership of young undocumented people within your ranks to ensure that people that, that are there are able to not only move through COVID, but move through the mourning that will happen in the next couple of months as the election results become clear. And using your power to ensure that young people of UWD, of young people in your midst are represented in each and every time a decision is made about our lives and their decision is being made about immigrants and undocumented people. So. 
I know that I don't have to. I know that I I can count on this group and this crew to be able to uh, to be very clear about where we're going. And I invite people um, to be able to see. Yes, the pandemic is a central piece that we're dealing with, but it's a larger systemic problem that's really grounded in race and class. Gracias, Grisa, and, and thank you so much again for all that you do. And I almost, you know, like if you haven't created the hashtag Radical Latina, I think we should start using it because it's, you know, part of it is challenging the status quo when it's keeping our communities oppressed. And with that, we're going to turn over to Natalia and Nancy, and then we're going to look at the Q&A. So if you haven't put in your question, please make sure Diana Cruz from Hispanic Federation is going to go through all the questions, and we're hoping to answer at least one or two of them before we conclude. Natalia, can you tell us how legal justice is challenging law systems to support our immigrant community here in the U.S.? Sorry, I had you on double mute. Um, so uh, Latina justice, I think, you know, we're I think we're challenging it by um, we have we have ongoing litigation going on um, from from the get go, and also by speaking out, um, by supporting concepts of people actually of people dreaming and actually thinking about and actually thinking about um, something anew and sort of cha and sort of changing. Um, Changing a perspective, I think, like Grisa was starting to, to, to suss out, like that this is a political issue one way or another. It is actually a human rights issue. These are human rights issues, which is, you know, people, whether you believe people deserve to be healthy um, and kind of the ignoring all of these things um, really, I think, says a lot about a misunderstanding of public health within the United States period as well. Um, but for Latina justice, when it comes up to legal, different legal challenges, I mean, we have ongoing legal challenges on racial, on racial, dis uh, racial profiling, um, challenging on detainers, uh, the use of detainers, and so ch challenging local law enforcement from being able to enforce federal law. Um, and so a lot of people have become emboldened to um, act upon their, their authority and expand upon their authority and think that they get to they get to be ICE officers as well. So we do have also, um, we have been challenging this intergovernmental, you know, uh, cooperation that's going on around the country that leaves us at, a, at the behest of surveillance um, and the people who are in charge of surveillance, which, you know, I think we've discussed over and over again, is a uh, power dynamic that has always been with Latinxs, Blacks, non-white majority persons at the losing end. Um, and so I think a, lo a lot of that is we're really focusing a lot on intergovernmental uh, cooperation and how to challenge that, challenging surveillance, um, trying to understand surveillance as well. It's not as easy as just going forward with that. I think other other things specifically to education, um, you know, we're right now we're spending a lot of time hearing from different organizers, hearing about different issues that are being exasperated in communities. So this can be issues where, you know, people are constantly ignoring the need to translate documents for limited English learners or for people who English is not their first language. This isn't a this isn't an option. This is this kind of just is exa exasperated from the concepts of the pan of what was going on before the pandemic, which is that anyone who didn't speak English was like the second class uh, student. But that stuff needed to be worked out. So we're constantly hearing about how you know packets that are being sent home are are purely in English, and that we have you know one or two pockets of of, of teachers that are advocating for their students and have to deal and have to deal with multiple parties who are kind of like don't do that because that's not within your contract, and then also don't do that because you're not the administration, and that's not the way it's supposed to be. When people are rolling out these education plans, it's supposed to be a accounting for all students and you know if they speak different languages that's part of it as well so this is so that's one of that's one thing the other thing is is also when we think about students and kind of thinking more broadly which is what is access to education so we were talking about the tech gap before that's of course a major issue but even kind of thinking about uh, the sensitivity of what it might mean for an undocumented student to be on camera um, and as a, as a student with their peers who have no idea what their lifestyle may be like, 
or for our for our little babies, for our toddlers, for people who are in those, you know, beginning years. It's not the same for someone to be able to be home and to give them a tablet. Let's say they're lucky enough to get a tablet. You can't leave a six year old on a tablet and say, oh, yeah, listen to your teacher. They're not listening when they're in there. They're little, you know, so kind of these, you know, just kind of I I, I don't want to be so negative, but you really have to think about how much this affects everybody not just if you don't have a tablet not just if you don't if you if you didn't get your packet in english the problems keep going on and so this is a difficult time for anyone that that situation is going to be for anyone but for latinx is when it comes up to this giant block you're asking undocumented com uh, community you're asking you know documented communities but people to come into your home which is a sacred place specifically for the undocumented community it, through the education system and also asking parents to show up to pick up those do the, those tablets. Do they need government ID to go pick up those tablets? Do they need, you know, what all these little, all these little steps require people to think about the general student population. And I don't say just the Latinx population because the thing is you, we are a part of the general population. We are the students. So the concept that it's like this is just for private only Latinx students or or only one type of students, I don't want to I want to push away from that because I think that makes people think that what they're doing for the Latinx students is extra. No, that's what the law requires and you need to be doing it. So and for us we need to be thinking about the different ways and not settling for those little things of like, okay, well at least I got that and then we'll work it out later. No. You keep pushing. You have rights. You have rights as parents, and you have rights as students. Now that's easier said, especially me here, documented and a, and, and, a, and an attorney. Um, that's easier said than done. But we. That's how we need to be thinking about how we can empower our people, because education is key to our community. Is key to our communities, and it's key to keeping our students and our and our and our youth safe. Um, and so I, you know, I, I just wanted to put that out there that these are different ways. It's not just about what specific lawsuits we're bringing, um, even though there are many that we are a part of. So I can I can send you a long list. Um, but at the same time, it's also kind of thinking very, very comprehensively about what this means for nuestra gente. So not just that they get a tablet, but how are we protecting them once they have that tablet? How are we protecting their privacy? Um, you know, and so going, you know, it, it's not just one level. You have to keep pushing. Thank you, Natalia. And I see that there's a clock up that says there's 10 seconds left. So I don't know what happens if it kicks us all out, but we're going to try to push it a little bit. And so, Nancy, if you could just talk a little bit about what uh, parents can do, our immigrant community can do to know their rights. And I don't know if you could do that like in a minute or less. And then just for all of you, mil gracias, uh, Natalia, Nancy, Gracia, and Ileana for your time, for all that you do every day. I just want you to end it with words of wisdom, words of inspiration. So Nancy, why don't you kick it off and jump off with the know your right, and then we're going to go into words of wisdom into the audience. I'm so sorry that we get, didn't get to answer your questions, but as you can see, we have just a wonderful uh, number of panelists here who are experts in what they do. So with that, Nancy, and then we'll turn it over to Ileana, then Natalie, and we'll end up with you, Grisa. <laughs> yeah, so I dropped a link to the time. Um, but in terms of organizing, I think just piggybacking off Grecia, um, as immigrant rights organizers, we know that, you know, right now it's a really intense time and folks are really um, aware of what's happening, right? Um, but there is a fear, right? Um, I think, you know, a lot of us, I myself grew up, um, Grew, or like was involved in the movement when, when we were actually challenging a lot of the Obama's um, policies, right, around like family separation, indefinite detention, and kind of as you mentioned, esta Cindy, like it wasn't um, the popular stance, right? So as immigrant rights organizers, what we know is that we need to hold both parties accountable, all parties accountable, everyone um, accountable for, for the atrocities that we're facing. And and the framework that we're doing that as races is around the migrant justice platform, right? And I think the best way to assert your rights is to build power, right? Um, right. So it's not just you confronting ICE when they come at your door, but your entire block who has a rapid response plan, right? Who knows what to do um, and things like that. But for us, as I says, we are really in terms of, of, of looking at migrant justice. Um, we want folks to know, right? Hope, you know, we don't know what the election results are going to be, but even within a democratic um, presidency, there's a lot of work to do, right? Uh, but there's also a lot of opportunity. So we really want to. Um, 
pursue right it, um, the, the the concept of migrant justice. Um, so, so kind of one of the main things within the migrant justice platform is that we actually don't believe that we need to continue with failed strategies such as strategies like comprehensive immigration reform that actually end up criminalizing our communities even more, right? And it also has been a largely failed strategy that has been the norm in immigrant rights organizing for over a decade. Um, so for us, you know, the migrant justice platform really is all our, our alternative, right? We know that there's a lot of opportunities in the executive branch, right? Um, and also with the next president to use his executive power is right to really remedy um, a lot of the wrongs that were done during this administration, right? So I would say, you know, um, just for everyone here, especially because we are a very Latino group, is that we need to get comfortable, right? So for, for, I think really learn from undocumented immigrants. For us, civic engagement is co is it's completely different, right? Yes, we cannot vote, but that's not does not mean that we're not engaged, right? And when you look at civic engagement and organizing, it's not just about electing someone into office, it's really about holding them accountable and watchdogging policies and actions, right? So there's just so much to do post um, election. So I just wanna everyone to just get comfortable, right? With the uncomfortable feeling of like, you you know, we do need to hold folks accountable and, and as immigrant communities, we don't need any more promises, right, or fake promises, we need action, right? So if you see um, immigrant rights groups going after, right, democratic candidates, going after kind of quote unquote who are people who are our friends, it's because we need to show, we need them to show us that they're our friends, right? Um, we're not just gonna take their word for it. So I felt, you know, so that's kind of like the framework that we really are organizing, especially for myself within Raices is really building a national net network of, of folks who um, are with us on the migrant justice platform, right? who are migrant justice warriors and accomplices to the immigrant rights community, right? At this time, we need active accomplices um, to, to make sure that, that we're getting free, right? That we're really challenging all these um, structural inequalities. So yeah, I would just recommend everyone to read the migrant justice platform, um, right? Really stray away from, a, again, a failed strategy of comprehensive comprehensive immigration reform that has only further criminalized our communities. Um, and really look at creative ways that we could actually make lives better for immigrants. So. I'll stop there. Gracias, Nancy. All right, words of inspiration. Natalie, Liana, Grace, please take us home. Cindy, do you mind if I go next? I do have to jump off in, in a little bit, but I don't want to leave without um, doing a go lot ahead, of Grace. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Um, so brothers and sisters, uh, what we do collectively in this moment, how we choose to show up in the coming months and years, it is what will put us all in a pathway to our collective liberation. We know that when the big moments come, the hard choices about priorities come, because we all know that they're going to come, that you will not be silent. I know you won't. So we are here to stay. We are here to build. We are here to love. And we are here in the streets organizing for justice. Victory is not inevitable. Victory is not inevitable. But I know it in my bones that we will win because we are our ancestors' wildest dreams, that in this country we are thriving. And we are not only doing that, but doing that with a heart to our people in service. And so thank you for being here today. Thank you for all of your support for United We Dream and United We Dream Action. And we are committed to take on this fight alongside with you all and the folks of the Hispanic Federation and all of the, the powerful ladies on this panel. Gracias, Lisa. All right. Natalia, Ileana. Uh, Ileana, you want to go first? Go for it. Okay. Okay. Um, so I just want to apologize. I thought, the, I thought that buzzer earlier was to fin for my time to finish that question. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, I guess, you know, important things to, important things to leave from here. Um, I think that, you know, obviously echo everything that Grisa said, but at the same time, to remember to um, take care of ourselves and also for us to be thinking about um, what care looks like and to not allow all this hate and oppression that's being heard about who we are to, to doubt us because we are what Grisa said. And so I think that's one of the most important things that needs that like we always need to think about and check in with ourselves and make sure that we're ready, that we're ready to go. And I think the other thing is, is, um, remembering to really think about, um, you know, that what we're asking for doesn't need to be in the paradigms that are being, uh, that are being presented to you. You are allowed to create new things. And, th and just because it's not written to law right now, doesn't mean it doesn't make sense, right? Like it, why doesn't it make sense for someone to be able to cross the border to work 
And what's what is wrong with that? If you were looking for work, where we are encouraged to work as people, and even in a capitalist society, we're encouraged to work as people. So working is supposed to be something that's healthy. So why wouldn't why wouldn't you? And what would you would you? And I don't. And I think that a lot of those those questions that we need to think about is really stripping away from what laws are out there now, um, and thinking more about what's real and what's humane. And why is it and, and stopping the criminalization of our people? Because the truth is, is that we we should be able to allow we should be allowed to cross borders that that is that that at most is trespassing. Right. Like that's at most trespassing when you think about it in a legal framework. So really thinking about, like, why do I question this? Why do I think that I have to be in a, in a certain frame in a certain framework? If I think it's I, if I think it's OK for people to work, I, if, if I think it's OK for people to want to feel safe. So I just really want to say that, like, you know, push yourselves and have tough conversations. That's like those are two of the most important things. Take care of yourself, push yourselves and have tough conversations within your family. Have co conversations about self-oppression, about about Latin, about being Latino and or being Latinx and also the different races that are within our own cultures and how important it is for us to fully recognize ourselves as a community in all of its beautiful colors and that, you know, we in the, we have rights. So. Gracias, Natalia. Gracias. Ileana? I mean, definitely agree with everything that has been said. And this has been a really inspirational and amazing panel of, you know, badass Latinas. Um, and I would just add that, you know, this, what better time than now to be engaged, to be active, to identify ways in whatever capacity individuals have um, to identify those creative solutions to so many of the challenges that we're seeing. It could be at home, at, you know, in our counties, at the state level, at the federal level, there are so many different ways to get engaged. Um, like Nancy said, our civic engagement goes beyond just this election that is coming up in the next two weeks. Um, and I think the last point I would make is also to, um, you know, for the allies to step up. I mean, many of us who have been undocumented, it's been 25 years um, that we've been dealing with this and it gets tiring and it is unfair for all the undocumented community to really take the burden of a lot of what happens. So really to step up and to also not expect for every undocumented person to be in front of a camera, to be an advocate, to be pushing for all of this. It really takes the entire community to be able to make this kind of change. Mil gracias, Ileana. And again, to all of our panelists, thank you for making time. As we head to November 3rd, please remember that the greatest act of disobedience is to vote. The greatest way that we protest, that we show up for our communities, that we speak up, that we show up is to vote. And also to the point that was been made that after the elections is holding our elected officials accountable. And so with that, thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you so much to the panelists for all that you do every single day in la lucha para nuestra comunidad. Gracias, HF. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists. Um, I just wanted to, I have no words to talk about this panel. This was fired. It was needed. Um, thank you so much for being here today. We will definitely stay connected. And uh, we will have a few other sessions after this. There are booth expos to meet some of our lead coalition members. I invite all of the attendees to join us. I will be hearing from the Committee of the Hispanic Children and Families and then the International's Network for So thank you so much, Cindy. Always a pleasure. Gracias. <laughs>